Good morning and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival Online in this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session. Our speaker today is Dr John Mellis, who is the author of Scotland's Science, Stories of Pioneering Science from the Scottish Enlightenment to the year 1900. The follow-on book, Scotland's Science Next, is about to be published. John is an alumnus of the Universities of Strathclyde and St Andrews and was a visiting professor at the University of Sunderland. He spent most of his career as a physicist and engineer at the BT Laboratories in Suffolk, where he still lives. Today, John tells the story of Dr. James Niven, a man who was far ahead of his time, a man whose work I am sure forms part of the basis of how we are, or should be, managing a global viral pandemic. I want to encourage you all to take part in this event and ask you please to enter your comments and questions in YouTube's live chat, and I'll present them to John after he's completed his talk. John, over to you. Oh, thanks uh, very much for that introduction, Eric. And thanks to everyone at the Orkney Science Festival for the invitation to talk. It's a great pleasure and a great privilege. And it's just a shame we can't all be there in person in Orkney to uh, enjoy face-to-face -face meetings. But um, perhaps next year that will be possible if we get this pandemic properly under control. I certainly hope so. But um, the, the subject I want to talk about this morning is a pandemic, but it's not the current one. It's the so-called Spanish flu, which had an even more devastating impact globally than what we're experiencing at the moment. And that happened at the end of World War One. And I want to concentrate on the story of the Scottish doctor who led the fight against the, the Spanish flu uh, in the north of England. Next slide, please. The story actually begins very far from the UK, uh, and in fact, far from Spain. Uh, in an American army training camp called Camp Funston, uh, in a military base called Fort Riley in Kansas, right in the middle of the United States, in the chicken farming countryside of Can Can Kansas. And that's, that's relevant, I think. Um, in the April of 1917, the USA abandoned its policy of neutrality and joined the war against Germany and the Ottoman Empire. And by the spring of the following year, Camp Funston was the training base for tens of thousands of American recruits, mostly from the southern states of the USA. Uh, incidentally, and very topically, Fort Riley is still very much in, in use. Uh, and in 2006, it was chosen as the consolidated training base for the USA's military transition teams uh, that were dispatched to Iran and Afghanistan to train the local security forces there. But going back to our story, uh, on March the 4th, 1918, an army cook called Private Albert Gitchell reported sick with symptoms of a headache, muscle pain, sore throat and a high fever, classic flu symptoms, and he was admitted to the camp hospital. Next slide, please. By the end of the day, that very day, the Fort Riley Hospital was treating around 100 patients with the same symptoms. And by the end of the week, that number was about 500. By the end of October, around 5,000 patients were treated with some suggestion that they were dominated by black recruits from very poor backgrounds in the states of Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, 
the spike of infections at Camp Funston was very sharp. You can see it in this diagram here. Uh, and it peaked at around 160 hospital admissions daily and around five deaths per day, mainly from resultant pneumonia. By June, the epidemic of flu at Fort Riley had actually subsided as American troops moved off and sailed for the battlefields of Europe. And in the end, uh, about 50,000 troops had been trained at Camp Funston and about 4 million American troops sailed to Europe to partake in World War One. Next slide, please. The first reported case uh, in the UK was actually very soon afterwards in May of 1918. And it was in Glasgow or it was in Port Glasgow. It's, it's not very clear in the, in the records. It mentions the Port of Glasgow. So it could well have been Port Glasgow. Um, and very soon the infection had spread right across the battlefields in Europe. And by the last week of June, uh, hospital admissions in the British Army were running at 46,000 or so. Of course, that was very bad news for all the combatants in World War I. Um, and wartime censorship restricted, heavily restricted, the news of the epidemic, uh, except in one place, which was Spain, which was a neutral country in the conflict. Uh, the Spanish king, King Alfonso, was infected and became gravely ill and nearly died. Uh, and the Spanish press were quite free in publishing the statistics of the infections and the deaths that, that were occurring in Spain. And that was the reason that the flu became known as the Spanish flu. And uh, very inaccurately, of course. Next slide, please. So the hero of our story um, was a Scottish doctor who was foremost in recognizing the seriousness of the flu pandemic and in taking uh, early proactive actions to manage it. James Nevin was born in Peterhead. Uh, he was one of five brothers and all of them were immensely clever and talented. Um, they were all adept at mathematics. Uh, his brother Charles was senior wrangler at Cambridge University, that means that he took first place in the Cambridge University mathematical tripos exams, uh, which was an achievement once described maybe a bit grandiosely as the greatest intellectual achievement in Britain. Um, and maybe it wasn't quite that, but it was certainly an impressive achievement. And um, many senior wranglers went on to have distinguished careers in mathematics and science. Uh, another brother, Charles, uh, sorry, uh, William Davidson Nevin was the director of the Royal Naval College and he worked with James Clark Maxwell and edited many of Maxwell's papers. Uh, James Nevin himself uh, took his first degree at the University of Aberdeen before going on to take a further degree in Cambridge and uh, qualifying eventually in medicine in London in 1880. He too became uh, a Cambridge University wrangler, but uh, he only achieved eighth place in the mathematical tripos exams, um, unlike some of his more uh, successful brothers. Still a very, very impressive achievement. Uh, after he qualified in medicine, Niven worked in general practice for a while before he was appointed as the chief medical officer uh, at Oldham in 1886. And there 
he had some formative experiences. He uh, was funded and sent to Berlin uh, to study the methods of Robert Koch, who was the discoverer of the tuberculosis bacteria. And he studied under Koch for some time before he came back to Oldham campaigning for anti-TB measures, including the effort to make TB a notifiable disease uh, and campaigning strongly for clean milk and, and pasteurized milk, which was by then realized as a major source of infection. Although at that time, Koch himself refused to acknowledge that that was a, an infective source. He carried on, Niven carried on in that vein when he became the chief medical officer in Manchester in 1984. And his first attack on health problems there was to lead the campaign for slum clearances, major improvements in housing, many thousands of proper WCs installed and proper sanitation arrangements, which had a dramatically good effect on the general public health of Manchester. Uh, as you might expect, with Niven's background uh, and training, he throughout his career was a rigorous statistician and placed huge importance on the proper collection of medical data and health data. Next slide, please. The first wave of the Spanish flu, the so-called Spanish flu, hit Manchester in June of 1918, and Niven took immediate action after observing its sudden effects at, at first hand. By the courtesy of Dr. Ritchie, I had the opportunity of seeing influenza occurring in schools. At one school, I observed children falling ill. They simply dropped on their desk like a plant whose roots had been poisoned. This aspect of onset was said to be common. Many of the measures that Niven took will be very familiar to us at the present time. He closed primary schools, uh, cinemas and theatres. Uh, he advocated ventilation and open spaces, mask wearing and hand hygiene. And much of those measures, many of those measures, were resisted vigorously locally. Now, you have to remember, of course, we're still talking about 1918 in the throes of World War I. So in Manchester's population, which at that time was around 700,000, in the first wave of the pandemic, his measures were remarkably successful. He recorded, um, he recorded only 334 deaths in Manchester during that first wave in the summer of 1918. It split fairly equally between men and women, uh, and uh, with infections and deaths also in children under 14 years. So that was a case mortality rate of less than 1% in Manchester's population. But already, even at that early time, there were indications that there was something strange about the, the Spanish flu. Unlike most flu infections, it wasn't just the very young and the very old who were dying but the middle-aged people in their 20s, 30s and 40s seem to be just as severely affected. Next slide, please. So despite his relative success in, in keeping the death rate down in those first waves of infections, Niven was very far from complacent and he was extremely proactive in producing public health advice in the form of precautionary leaflets, 
We had 35,000 leaflets printed and distributed, 500 large public information posters, which recommended those measures that I've already mentioned, hand washing, wearing of face masks, good ventilation, disinfection of, of surfaces, and they prescribed how that should be done. And for those who were infected, uh, he recommended self-isolation for 10 days in a warm room. Of course, for many of the people of Manchester, self-isolation in a warm room was not particularly easy to achieve, given the overcrowded and cold conditions that many people had experienced. But Niven also arranged for the distribution of coal and food, especially baby milk, which was well targeted to the most socially deprived areas of the city, uh, according to the data that he analysed. And he said, So far as one can judge at present in checking further outbreaks, it will be necessary to rely chiefly on general preventative measures to include the maintenance of a reasonable distance between the sick and the healthy, care of the hands, avoidance of common towels and common soap, careful washing out of common basins, avoidance of the handling in common of food to be afterwards cooked and other like precautions. Above all, the immediate segregation of persons attacked. Next slide, thank you. Um, Niven's recommendations were highly unpopular locally uh, with politicians and publicans and cinema owners, as you might expect. And they were unpopular also with the national government, which had a war to fight and an economy to sustain. The government's principal medical officer, if you like, the Chris Whitty of his time, was a Yorkshireman, a public health expert called Sir Arthur Newsholm. And he was sceptical about the possibility of containing the outbreak. And he said, to paraphrase, I know of no public health measure which can resist the progress of pandemic influenza. Given the difficulty of preventative measures in wartime and national circumstances in which the major duty is to carry on, even when risk to health and life is involved. News Home is often cast as the villain of this story, but actually he was a strong advocate of state medicine and good social housing. And he did commission work to try to develop a Spanish flu vaccine. Unfortunately, that vaccine was based on the idea that the infective agent was a pneumonia bacterium called Pfeiffer's bacillus, which was often found in autopsy in the lungs of victims. That was indeed the cause of death for many of the flu victims, but it wasn't, of course, the primary infective agent, which was a virus. And the role of viruses uh, as major causes of infection at that time was only beginning to be understood uh, after various discoveries or suspicions of discoveries of viruses at the end uh, of the 19th century. So, News Home's efforts to create a vaccine, in the end, a successful vaccine came to naught, although Niven did, in fact, use vaccines uh, on a trial basis in Manchester, um, basically, which confirmed that they were not effective against the disease. In another echo or, or, or uh, precursor, perhaps, of, of modern times, David Lloyd George, who was then the Prime Minister, visited Manchester to receive the keys of the city. Uh, and this was in the autumn of 1918. Um, against Niven's advice, Lloyd George's visit attracted huge crowds and Lloyd George contracted 
himself the Spanish flu very severely uh, was put on artificial respiration in a rapidly made up ward room in Manchester Town Hall. Lloyd George nearly died and uh, he ended up being isolated for 10 days in Manchester Town Hall in this makeshift ward room. It took him, in fact, many months to recover from that attack. And uh, of course, as we know, luckily he survived. Next slide, please. So the visit of Lloyd George plus the next event that autumn, which was the armistice, brought huge crowds to Manchester celebrating the end of the war on the 11th of November. And shortly afterwards, there was a huge second wave of infection, which was even more lethal in Manchester and elsewhere. There is a suspicion that the virus had mutated, had mutated between the first and second waves, uh, and recent uh, genetic evidence seems to confirm that, and Niven certainly suspected it. In France, at casualty clearing station number 11, a Scottish nurse, Sister Catherine McPhee, described the scene. So we moved up to St Andre after the army went into Lille and almost immediately we started taking in wounded and many who had Spanish influenza as well. The boys were coming in with colds and a headache and they were dead within two or three days. Great big handsome fellows, healthy men, just came in and died. Oh, well, there was no rejoicing in Lille the night of the armistice. Niven recorded 1,715 deaths in Manchester in that second wave during the last few weeks of 1918. A shortage of coffins and grave diggers prompted Niven to bemoan the desire of relatives of the dead on insisting on strict observance of custom with its paraphernalia of hirsch coaches is an elaborate oak coffin. The second wave eventually subsided in Manchester as elsewhere, and Niven relaxed some of his public health restrictions. But within a month, they were back in place as a third wave of infections took nearly another thousand lives in Manchester at the beginning of 1919. Next slide, please. The worldwide picture was very similar as millions of soldiers were demobil demobilized at the end of World War I and returned home. Uh, and the pattern of waves was similar, but even more severe abroad. The Spanish flu killed more people in 12 months than in the four years of World War I. Uh, and the deaths in World War I, as reference, were about 20 million, equally divided approximately between military deaths and civilian deaths. In the USA, for example, 700,000 people died about 0.7% of the population. And I read that that was more deaths than in the two world wars and the Korean and Vietnam wars combined. I found that statistic fairly amazing and I went back to check it. And indeed it's true. So the total American deaths in those four wars were about 600,000 compared to the 700,000 who died during the Spanish flu pandemic. Perhaps the worst affected, uh, worst affected country was India, where millions of British Empire troops returned after the war. The statistics in India are a little bit uncertain, but most estimates 
suggests that 12 to 17 million people died. Um, overall, 28% of the world's population were infected, remembering that at that time the world's population was much smaller than it is now, about 1.8 billion then. Uh, and the number of deaths has been estimated as between 50 and 100 million. Next one, please. So after the pandemic, James Niven did some reviews of his statistics and he actually uh, uprated his estimates of the infections and the death rate in Manchester so that it ended up to be about five deaths per thousand of population, which actually is not too different from other towns in the north of England or in England generally. But it was an excellent result given the overcrowding and the social deprivation that was being experienced in Manchester at that time. Niven retired in 1922. His wife had died seven years previously uh, and his daughters left home around that time as well. And he wrote up his experiences over a long career as public health officer in Manchester in, the, in a memoir called Observations on the History of Public Health Effort in Manchester. Overall, in his career, he was remarkably successful in reducing mortality in Manchester. The annual death rate reduced during his career from about 24 per thousand to 14 per thousand due, as I say, largely to his efforts in making TB a notifiable disease, in improving housing and sanitation, uh, and improving the cleanliness of milk. But um, very sadly, after retirement, Nevin became lonely and depressed. Uh, and in 1925, on a short solo holiday in the Isle of Man, he took his own life by drinking poison and drowning in a uh, local harbour. Perhaps he missed his lifetime <clears throat> medical vocation. Perhaps he was disappointed by the political resistance he had encountered in trying to manage the Spanish flu, but we will never know. Next slide, please. To really understand the severity of the Spanish flu pandemic, it's interesting, I think, obviously, to compare the, uh, its effect to the effects of the coronavirus pandemic that we're still experiencing. As I said, Spanish flu infected about 28% of the then world population of 1.8 billion. And if we take 70 million as the sort of middle estimate of the number of deaths at that time, then that works out as a case mortality of about 14% uh, and a global mortality of nearly 4%, 3.8% uh, to be precise, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, if we compare that to the COVID-19 statistics of about a week ago, then the current global total of deaths is running at around 4.4 million. On the, less, on the left, um, and that works through to uh, mortality rate globally of less than 0.1%. So we can just see very clearly in those graphs how much more severe the Spanish flu was compared to the lethal effects of the current pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, in the UK, uh, the picture was similar, but a little bit different. So in 1918-19, the UK population was 17.8 million, and the total number of deaths uh, ended up at around 228,000 or so. Um, that compares to our current population of about 67 million with deaths running, I think the current death number in the 
coronavirus pandemic is around 133,000. Um, so again, we can see that uh, the Spanish flu had a much more dramatic impact than anything we're seeing at the moment. Um, although compared to other places like uh, India and America, actually the UK got off relatively lightly in the Spanish flu pandemic. Next slide, please. So one obvious question is, what happened to the Spanish flu virus? Why did it apparently fade away, never to be seen again after 1920? Well, that is actually very far from the truth. Um, in the late 1990s, the samples of the Spanish flu virus were obtained from preserved samples from lung autopsies from Spanish flu patients, including some from a corpse uh, excavated from the permafrost in a place called Brave Ignition in Alaska. And Alaska, strangely, was one of the places in the world which was very severely affected by the Spanish flu. Um, from those uh, genetic analyses, which were done in the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta and other places, we now know that the Spanish flu was originally an avian virus, uh, an H1N1 virus named after the, uh, the proteins that the genes and the virus code for. Um, and that fits very well with the idea that uh, patient zero in the epidemic was Private Gitchell, who was an army cook, cook at Camp Funston, and no doubt very much in contact with, with chickens alive and dead. But uh, the genetic sequencing of that Spanish flu virus shows that actually it was the antecedent of nearly every flu virus which has caused pandemics since then, including the H2N2 epidemic of Asian flu in the late 50s, early 60s, the Hong Kong flu of the 1960s, and the H1N1 swine flu of 2009 are all descendants of that original uh, Spanish flu virus. So in that sense, we know that the Spanish flu really was the mother of all flu pandemics. And these more modern variants are now part, uh, make up part of the almost annual seasonal flu epidemics that we, we currently experience. Last slide, please. So um, there has been loads and loads written about the Spanish flu in general not very much about James Niven and his life actually, but um, this talk is based on a chapter in um, my book, Scotland Science Next, which, which will be published soon around the end of the month, which includes a chapter called Pandemic Fighting the, Sp the Spanish Flu. And that uh, book contains uh, lots of references to where you can find further information about the Spanish flu in general. and. James Niven in particular. There's a couple of things on YouTube that, that are worth a look as well. There's um, a BBC film dramatization called Spanish Flu, The Forgotten Fallen, which stars Bill Patterson in the, in the role of James Niven. I think that was made in about 2009 and it disappeared for a while, but it's been posted on, on YouTube fairly recently and uh, on those two links that you can see and that's that's worth a watch. Um, and there are some other things, including the link at the bottom, which are shorter explanations of what James Niven did in Manchester in the north of England. So thanks for listening. Uh, that's the end of the talk. I hope you enjoy the rest of the Orkney International Science Festival and um,
hopefully we've got some questions, Eric, that, that we can answer. <laughs> John, that was uh, fantastic. I, I have a confession to make. I got drawn right into that talk. I nearly <laughs> forgot my duties and my role as speaker host. And for, I was forgetting to monitor the questions. Yes. But, uh, I, I have I've remedied myself. There are quite a <laughs> Take that as a compliment. Take that as a compliment. Good, thank you. I tell you, the, he must have um, he must have had a considerable influence in the political network at the time, being you know a regional a regional man in the job he did. But he, he obviously got things done, and he must have got resources to to be able to do what he wanted to do or needed thought he needed to be done. You know, he was. Yeah. He was yeah. How what was yes. the network at the time? You know, trying to compare it to what's going on today in the head. Yeah. Well, of course, the, at that time, uh, things were very different. There, uh, there, obviously, there was no National Health Service, but there was no central government uh, Department of Health or Ministry of Health either. So uh, the villain of our piece, who I don't think really was a villain, Sir Arthur News Home, he was the chief medical officer of something called the Local Government Board. Um, and it was his job to coordinate the responses to public health hazards, but at a local level. So it was purely uh, a central government coordinating response. It wasn't the kind of setup we have now where diktats can, can kind of be issued centrally and, and people are expected to obey. So I've got quite a lot of sympathy for News Home, uh, to be honest. He's, he had a hard job to do. Obviously, at least in the early stages of the outbreak, a war was on. People had to go to the munitions factories. People had to go to work, uh, and uh, and all the rest of it. So, you know, tough job for any government, perhaps, in dealing with with lethal pandemics. But a particularly hard job, I think, for the government at that time in in, in the middle of a war, at least towards the end of a war. Yeah, got, a question came in as what percentage of infected people actually died, and then I saw in the last few slides it's somewhere between ten and. 20%, and I think 14% was the number you, you put on your final comparison. Yeah, I think I think the global uh, mortality in the end was was about 4% 4, 4 in the end, I think 3.8%, something like that. It's a but, um, you know, for, for all the deaths that we've had um, from uh, COVID-19, um, that... Uh, bearing in mind the, the world population, of course, is much larger than it was then. Um, I said we're, we're experiencing less than 0.1% mortality globally from the coronavirus yeah. pandemic. But of course, it'd be a mistake to it'd be a mistake to to say that the story of the current pandemic is is over. Um, large parts of the world, particularly in Africa, are still for whatever reason, relatively unaffected by by COVID-19. So, you know, sadly, there's a, a long way to go, I think. And how the eventual statistics end up for the current pandemic uh, is, is another is another guess. Yeah, it's actually, there's a comment has just come in, actually, and it was about the death rate amongst Maori folk was huge. Uh, really? It's the same again with this current virus. So there's... There's perhaps something to do with genetics uh, in there as well, and I think there's a talk uh, later on today about genetics and. Um... Yeah, I think that could could well well be right. I mean, the worst affected places, proportionately, um, in the Spanish flu, were Alaska, as as, as I mentioned, where the uh, the Inuit population suffered very badly, but also in places like Indonesia, uh, and the Pacific Islands, Fiji, and the Pacific Islands, for example, they had incredibly high mortality rates. Um, so you might be right. I, I don't know if genetics is as a part to play in that, or whether it was just lack of exposure, perhaps to um, more common flu viruses that were circulating. Yeah, yeah. There's actually there's another thing that crosses my mind, John. It's you know the the general. <laughs> relative deprivation and poorer health care amongst the general population, did that contribute? It must have contributed to the yeah. rate, I would have thought. I, I, absolutely. And that was that was Nevin's main insight. Um, maybe it wasn't rocket science, but he, he, he was very conscious that, because, because he was a great gatherer of statistics, 
he, he was very conscious and he could prove that the rates of infection and the rates of mortality were so much higher in, in areas of social deprivation. And probably, you know, the biggest achievement of his career uh, was was a, in, in social housing improvements in Manchester. He, he um, you know, he was just a, a, an advocate and a pioneer of uh, proper toilets and, uh, and milk pasteurization and all the rest of it that, that I that I mentioned. But so, something I forgot to mention was in the second wave uh, of 1918. Of course, doctors had no real weapons to to combat people who were infected. Um, the vaccine didn't work, as as I as I mentioned, because really awareness of viruses wasn't wasn't there. Um, so doctors had, had few weapons, but uh, aspirin had had come off patent the year before. Uh, aspirin had been patented by the German company Bayer, and it had come off patent in 1917 and become very cheap. So some doctors seized on aspirin uh, as a cure for the flu and and, and a, a cure for the extreme immune responses that killed many people, just as uh, the coronavirus um, often has a lethal effect through a, an overreaction of the immune system. It was the same with the Spanish flu. And so doctors were um, prescri prescribing aspirin in absolutely huge amounts. Doctors were prescribing aspirin um, in doses up to 30 grams a day, 30 grams a day. The standard aspirin dose is 150 milligrams. So um, many of the, uh, the deaths, it's believed anyway that many of the deaths in uh, the second wave were actually due to aspirin poisoning because uh, you know aspirin is just very toxic in, in huge doses like that. You're killed by the cure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's a potentially contentious couple of questions that are related in here. It's um, what contribution to the impact of COVID, so the current one, um, do you think that overpopulation and particular ageing population has, you know, are we by improving our healthcare and longevity, are we actually increasing the size of the target <laughs> that the virus can, can hit? Yeah. It's not... My, my camera's wobbling about here now. <laughs> my nice new camera as well. That's annoying. Yeah, I mean, it's not only a bigger target, but it's it's obviously... Um, the, World War I was maybe the first example of mass uh, global travel because of the millions, literally millions of soldiers which came and went in the course of that war. And, and of course... Um, international travel being as it is now, plus a population of nearly 8 billion people, um, gives a big target and a, and a huge opportunity. But, uh, you know, going back to social deprivation and overcrowding and all that, I saw a map, I think it was a BBC map that uh, the BBC published recently of uh, case mortality from coronavirus in the UK compared to overall mortality um, in the early years of the 20th century in the UK. And the maps, the hotspots were depressingly, depressingly similar, um, concentrated absolutely on areas of social deprivation and overcrowding. So really cause number one, I think, or uh, in, in any pandemic. John, we've come to nearly the end of time. I'm going to close with one last question. Do you think that patient zero will be traced for the COVID-19 pandemic? <laughs> that's that's a very hard question. Um, I think we're being handicapped by a certain amount of reticence on, on, on the part of the, uh, the Chinese government and health services. I mean, there's a lot of contention. Obviously, there was the food market question Obviously, there was the Institute of Virology in, in Wuhan as well, who I think have been less than transparent. Um, there is some suggestion that patient zero 
patient one and patient two were actually admitted to hospital in Wuhan in November uh, of 2019. I don't know if that, I don't think that will ever be verified. But um, yeah, that's an open question. And in fact, it's an open question actually in the Spanish flu, although we, we put the, uh, the label on private Kitchell, there's some suspicion that there were some Spanish flu cases recorded in further west in Kansas um, uh, a few weeks before that by a local a local doctor who recorded mysterious flu symptoms in some of our patients. So, but we'll, we'll pin the label on private Gitchell anyway. <laughs> no, John, I'm going to have to call time on this. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for actively taking part and submitting their perceptive questions. And of course, John, thank you so much for that enlightening and thought-provoking talk. It makes me ponder how our great and good are actually orchestrating the appropriate action to control and minimise the consequences of our virus, COVID-19. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Our, you're very welcome. Our next talk is called The Shetland Weaver and the Mortal Pox and begins at 11.30 this morning. The story of how a Shetland weaver developed his own system of inoculation to save the lives of thousands of people from smallpox. If you're enjoying the festival, please consider donating. Full details of how to do so are below in the description. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram and follow our YouTube channel. Remember, the Festival Club will be open this evening at half past nine. It's great fun, great chat. Anyway, that's all for this session. Goodbye for now. <laughs>